Hi guys, welcome to another Monday Night Study. Uh, today I wanted to go over some really interesting things to you. I've actually found out a couple of things today and I wanted to share them with you. But basically, uh, we're going over the Dead Sea Scrolls and what we've done, well, we'll get there in a second. I just wanted to say, first off, uh, in reference to the calendar, uh, tomorrow on the Gregorian calendar is... Um, the midwinter uh, mark, which is Groundhog Day. And of course, the Latins did things kind of odd by starting the year in the middle of winter and things like that. So the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, of course, starts in the spring equinox and goes forward. But one of the things I was thinking about, and this is pretty interesting, and I'll just go ahead and show it to you if we hop over to our Bible Facts website and uh, go to our calendar. Um, just pull this one up here. This is our basic calendar. And as you know, um, they sync everything to the week and to the Sabbath. So the new year always starts or a new season always starts on a Wednesday. So if you have 90 days for a season, the middle day is day 45. So that's exactly six and a half weeks later. So if you count down from here, six weeks to here and then go a half, it actually comes out on a Sunday. And I always thought that was interesting because we've done studies before because people have asked us who had the authority to change the Sabbath to Sunday. And of course, the answer was, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's the way it's always been. Uh, Sundays is the day that you study with your students. Saturdays are the Sabbath when you do the rituals in the temple. And so people forget that. Uh, but even more important than that, and we'll come back to this, since this is the pattern, the first of a, of a spring fall, winter, or summer is always going to be the first of that particular month, and it's always going to be on a Wednesday. Well, a month and a half later, which is halfway through a season, the 17th, which is a Sunday always on that calendar, is mid-spring. So today I'm broadcasting this on the uh, first. Actually, let me go back, pick the right calendar here just to make sure that we've got this. If we go to our basic calendar, dsscalendar.org, this will show you the Dead Sea Scroll date, Gregorian, weekday and time, and the Pharisee date. Um, so today, with the Jewish calendar, we're only one day off, although the years are quite a bit off. But if we go to the current calendar, which is March 2020 to March 2021, uh, what we'll see is we'll go down here to, uh, this is February 1st. So here's February 1st. It's the 18th of Shabbat on their calendar. And yesterday was the midwinter uh, uh, mark. And ag again, the, the, all the midwinters, solstices, equinoxes are all within three days of the actual date, the variance. And it goes by to where you're three days off and then you add a leap week. But anyway, what I wanted to show you is, and this is interesting because tomorrow we'll be celebrating Groundhog Day and it'll be officially midwinter so things will start getting warmer we'll get back to spring and hopefully flu season and covid season and that kind of stuff will be over but anyway so it's just a couple of days difference but going to the bat very far beginning here so we've got um the first is on a wednesday passover of course always on a tuesday on their calendar and we go on down, and it's the same thing. Mid-spring is the 17th of the second month. And I wanted to bring that up to you because this is really interesting. So mid-spring is the 17th of ER or the 17th of the second month. So we'll come back to that in our uh, study today. So what we've been doing, let me go back to here, and we'll go back to our study. And now here's our basic uh, Bible Facts homepage. This is us broadcasting at the moment. But we've done this Dead Sea Scroll Study Center. And we have a master list. We've been looking at that. And what that is, is all of the Dead Sea Scrolls in Caves 1 through 11, excluding 4. And then over here is Cave 4. The reason we did that is because there's about a 1,000 manuscripts and close to 600 of them, over half, are all from cave four. So we're trying to figure these out. So what we're doing is we're going to, well, what we have done rather 
is we've uh, pulled all the scrolls together about the calendar, created a calendar book, a calendar website, which you just saw, dsscalendar.org. And then we pulled all of the testaments of the patriarchs together that exist, which is their basis for their theology. That's how you interpret the Old Testament if you're in a scene. So extremely important to understand them. Uh, and like real briefly, they taught that the Messiah would be God incarnate, come to die for our sins. They set the date for uh, when you convert it to our calendar, it's 32 AD. Um, a bunch of other things like that. He'd be born of a virgin. The Pharisees got off. They've apostatized and a bunch of other things. So all the extra biblical prophecies, all the extra biblical teachings are in line perfectly with the New Testament, which is what, as a Christian, we go by. And many of you know that I, I'm a Calvary Chapel guy. I don't pastor a church, but I attend a really good Calvary Chapel in Olathe, Kansas. Um, and we have our Bible study um, on Tuesday nights, which is very similar to what we're doing here on Monday nights. So what we've done here is I've picked the ones of Genesis and Exodus, because sometimes they overlap in the scrolls. Uh, I imagine they've had scrolls that have, you know, all of the Torah in them, uh, but these are highly fragmented. So uh, 1Q1 and 1Q2, and then over here there are several Genesis scrolls from Cave 4, and we've got a lot more here. So when we mark them off, I've already got them kind of compiled. So let me show you again, and this is going to be really cool, a really cool study. Again, what they've done is kind of mishandled um, the definitions, in my opinion. So you've got something when you pick up a scroll, and it's obviously Genesis, say, 5, verses 5 through 10 or something. You can look at a big chunk of this and know, ah, that's just Genesis. There's nothing there but Genesis. And sometimes there's an extra word or spelling difference or something like that, but it's just Genesis. So those manuscripts, they're going to take and set aside and say those are Bible manuscripts. Okay, sometimes we'll have a, a, a true commentary, which is going to say this is Genesis one, one and two, and then the commentary is this what it this is what it means to the Essenes, and then here's verses three and four, what it means to the Essenes. So it's going to be for chapter and verse commentary, ch chapter and verse commentary. Well, everybody agrees that's a commentary, no problem, but they still set those aside and don't use them, and I don't know why, but Here's the deal. If you take those, even if you ignore the commentary, you can pull the scriptures out of that and come over here and put them with the scripture Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you're going to compile these and recreate them, instead of having half of the Old Testament, we could have close to two-thirds of the Old Testament if you would just use the Bible passages out of the commentaries. And that's what we're trying to do. This is this next really big uh, thing. And so then we have stuff called uh, para-biblical uh, text or rewritten biblical text. And there might actually be some rewriting of the stories, paraphrases, so to speak. But if you look really careful at those, what you're going to find is it's not really even a rework. It's just a different way of doing the commentary. Instead of saying, Scripture says, verses 1 and 2, word perfect, and then we interpret that as, and then here's the commentary, that clearly defines the scripture, the scripture and the commentary. In this case, and you've probably seen some Bibles like this, where you've got a verse and some commentary on the verse, the next verse, commentary on the verse. Sometimes they're color-coded. The blue or uh, red will be the commentary, the black is the Bible. But in a Dead Sea Scroll, or just something you and I would type out, there's no color codes. So people will get confused and think, is, where does the scripture end and the commentary start? Well, that's the same thing with these, and so they've decided that there, there must be rewritten commentaries. Now, there are the Testaments, and those are different, uh, written by the actual people themselves, like we have the Testament of Abraham, part of it, uh, part of the Testament of Noah. Those things are fantastic. I have Jewish friends that really believe these were written by Noah and Abraham, their personal will and testaments, and that's what the Essenes taught. 
And to my Jewish friends that believe that, I ask you, please read them. Because if you read them, they will tell you about Messiah. And again, it agrees perfectly with the New Testament way of looking at Messiah. So that's pretty interesting. So let's set these aside now. Let me show you what I've did. Now on this page up here, we've got DSS Old Testament. So let me just click on it. This is a PDF. And actually, yeah, okay. Um, and what we will be adding to this, you're welcome to download it, look at it, but we'll be adding to it as we go along. And this is what I wanted to show you, uh, probably the first nine chapters or so of Genesis tonight and show you how this really makes a bit of a difference. So starting off, we've got Genesis, let me go down here, and Exodus, I'm trying to put them together, and the DSS by number, we could come all the way down here to the bottom. And what we've done here is, um, let's go back up to Genesis, started with just Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy. But so for instance, here's 1Q1, and again, that's Cave 1 of Qumran, the first scroll. And this is Cave 2 of Qumran, the first scroll. Cave 4 of Qumran, the first scroll, like that. So here is Genesis, and here are the passages that are in that particular scroll. You know, it's fragmented, torn the sides, holes in it. So you've got just certain passages. And so what we can do is take all of these and recreate Genesis. And then you have the paleo texts. And as you can see, like this scroll's got some of Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. Where numbers is at, I don't know, but it's just what they were doing. And then some of these are the commentaries. And so the commentaries, for instance, this one's always ignored. It's 4Q254. It's Genesis 6, uh, 8, 11, and part of 49. And then there's a commentary on those passages. So at the very least, even if you don't like their commentary, look at the Genesis passages and see. So let's do that. We'll go back to the top and we'll just start with Genesis 1. And I want to show you these things. And this is really, I think, fascinating. And again, the way this works is if the Dead Sea Scroll text of Genesis is identical, word perfect, with what we have in our Masoretic text, the Hebrew that, the, say, the King James is based off of, NIV, all those, then we just have it in black. If there's a different text, if it says Abraham instead of Abram or something like that, the different part will be in red. And the we'll show you the red with a line through it is what the other one was. So here's Genesis 1. So here's an example. We'll just read this, and you'll find it very familiar. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good and divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. This was the evening and morning of the first day. Now you can take a King James, a New King James, an NIV, an NASB, and they're all going to be slightly different in their wording because they're an English translation. So this might be slightly different from what you're reading in your regular Bible. But the point is, if it's all in black, the Hebrew is identical to our Hebrew. And so we're only looking for what passages exist, which ones have been tor torn off and lost, and what's different. So going on, God said, let there be a firmament in the middle of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and called the waters which were under the firmament different from what he called the ones above the firmament. Okay, and it was so. God called the firmament heaven. And this was the evening and the morning of the second day. So all that's correct. So we have a full copy of Genesis 1, starting in verse 1 all the way down to verse 8, and it's word perfect. Now when we get to 9, there's some differences. And I want to show you this. This is the kind of differences that are in there, and they really don't make any difference. Uh, unless it's a cool commentary. Verse 9 says, And God saw, said rather, Let the waters 
under the heaven be gathered together in one place. Now the word for place, see if I can do this here, the word for place is the same, the same Hebrew word that we have in our Masoretic text, our Old Testament. They changed it to collection. Now the waters are collected together in one collection or in one place. It doesn't really make any difference. And the thing is, there'll be many different passages of Genesis. Some of the Genesis passages will say place and others will say collection. But we just want to note any differences in the text. It goes on and says, let the dry land appear, and it was so. That's where our Genesis 9 ends. Their Genesis 9, 9 has an extra sentence. And the waters under the heaven were gathered together into their place, and the dry land appeared. Uh, notice it's place and not collection. But what you're seeing here is basically God says, let it be gathered together, and it was so. There says God said, let it be gathered together, and it was so, what? That it was gathered together. They just kind of repeat the same thing. So it's not necessary. Um, but it's interesting just to see that. Now, again, you could say, were they adding to Scripture, or was this just a commentary? Since it's identical to the other top part of the thing, I, was, I would say it's just a, a typo or something that they wanted to affirm. Uh, if it's other information, it's probably part of a commentary. So we don't want to get too excited about are they adding to Scripture. They're probably not adding to Scripture because they consider Scripture extremely holy. So it's a commentary that they did in a different form. So going on, let me just share a couple of things here. We go on and creates the earth, and basically the rest of the chapter for the seven days of creation are the same. We go all the way through... Uh, verse 20s and all the way down to verse 28 God blessed them God said to them be fruitful multiply replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth and we're missing verses 29 and 31 29 and 31 it's it's not that they didn't have it but the end of the manuscript is ripped so they probably did have it. So again, when you have Genesis and this word perfect for large sections, you should assume the entire thing is there. You're going to need to find a manuscript that has something different to say that maybe one of our people added to the manuscript. And remember, these are anywhere from 1st century B.C. to 2nd, maybe even 3rd century B.C., so these are the oldest copies of, of these things. So let's go on. Here's Genesis 2. We won't read it, but let me just show it to you. Verses 1 and 2 we have. It's word perfect. We're missing verses 3 and 5. And here's verse 6 and 7. Again, word perfect. We're missing verses 8 to 13. And then we have verses 14 to 19. And we're missing the end part, which is 20 to 25. So a large section of chapter 2. We have the same thing with chapter 3. 1 and 2, we're missing 3 to 10. And then we have 11 through 14, missing 15 to 24. And so again, as we, the reason why this will be changing is as we go through looking for other commentary, rewrite, rewriting of Genesis, those kind of things, to see if it's actually the Genesis plus commentary, We'll be able to pull the commentary back and put in here. We'll see that in a minute. So here's Genesis 4 about Cain and Abel. We're missing verse 1. As you can see, it starts with verse 2. And what we're doing is going down to verse 11. We're missing 12 to 26. Now, Genesis 5, we're missing the first 12 verses. We have verse 13. This is significant because when it says Cain lived after Mahaliel, after he begot Mahaliel, 840 years and fathered sons and daughters. The 840 years is significant because numbers always get corrupted. The Septuagint, I think, has 740 or something like that. So this shows you that the oldest manuscripts we have that predate the Septuagint by at least 100 years agree with our Hebrew Old Testament. That's why we need to use a Hebrew 
Old Testament based Bible, not a Septuagint one. Don't throw away the Septuagint because it's got some interesting points to it. Uh, but just understand that the dates are kind of off. Now, Genesis 6. Let me show you this. Uh, we were missing verses 1 through 3, or actually 1 through uh, 12. And we had verses 13 to 21 and missed the last verse. And this is, to me, it's nice, but I mean, I wish they would have had the first part of Genesis 6 with the Nephilim and all that kind of stuff. But they didn't. I'm, I'm sure they had it, but it wasn't there. But then, going through the commentaries, we found a commentary or a rewrite you know, that they were putting in a different section of verse 3. Not a big deal. Verse 3 says, The Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, and yet his days shall be 120 years. Word perfect. The cool thing about this is, is that this is part of a commentary. So that's the scripture. What do they say about this verse? You've probably known people that have said, what is that 120 year period? Does, did lifespans shorten to 120 years? Are we talking about 120 years before the flood and they had 120 years to repent? What is the hundred? It's kind of vague, you know, in the King James anyway. So here's the commentary, and what I did is put it at the bottom. So commentary number one, this is from 4Q252. The commentary on Genesis 6-3 says, Their end began in the 480th year of Noah's life, when God said, My spirit will not always strive with man forever. They had 120 years until the time of the waters of the flood. And then I put to repent to make it understandable. Anything in square brackets is my commentary. So you can forget that if you want. Um, anything in parentheses, of course, would be their commentary. So anyway, so they're interpreting this as the 120 years is that last 120 years. 480 plus 120 is 600, which is when how old Noah was when the flood occurred. So very interesting. Now let's go up and look at this again. So we had that, and then we have um, all of this. And this is what I want to focus on tonight, this particular chapter. So verse 13 says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, seal it inside and outside with pitch and this is the fashion fashion which you shall make of it it of rather uh the length of the ark will be a hundred or three hundred cubits its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits this is all identical okay with genesis but notice we have a piece of a commentary right here so going down to verse 2 at this point, this is from 4Q254A. So it's the first little piece of the fragment of the 254th manuscript found in Cave 4 of Qumran. This is why we want to compile all this, and this is why it gets really interesting. So this says, this is the computation of making the arc. It's 300 cubits is the length of the arc. 50 cubits is its width, and 30 cubits. And the measurement of the ark is something else. Now, this is exactly what the scripture says, but it's a part of a commentary. They're getting ready to tell you something else, but we're missing that part. So this didn't really help us much, but it's nice to have that. And if we can pull all the commentary together and put in here with us, we can have the scriptures, the commentary, the supposed rewritten stuff, all together in one spot. So we can have the Bible, the Old Testament, the patriarchs, and then the calendar, and then what's left. And it'll really make the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls much easier. So, and then it goes on. He makes, a, makes the rest of the ark, puts the fowls in. So we have all the way down to verse 21, and we're missing verse 22. Now, this is interesting to me because this is Genesis 6. 
Now, with the Dead Sea Scrolls proper, we had Genesis 1 through Genesis 6, and then it skipped to Genesis, I think, 11 or 12, where we're missing 7, 8, 9, and 10, and maybe 11. But four whole chapters thoroughly missing because it's not a biblical text. Ah, but then comes the rewritten or the commentaries. So this is what I want to show you. This is pretty cool. Genesis 7 all of a sudden appears. We're still missing verses 1 to 9, which might be in there somewhere. And if so, we'll find it. But verses 10, 11, and 12. And let me just read that to you. It came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Remember, uh, and this is identical with Genesis 7. Noah was shut up in the ark, and then the flood came. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Now, I want to stop there just for a second. And this is why I started with the calendar part. This is in the 600th year of Noah's life. That's the year 1656. It was in the second month of that year, the 17th day of the month, when the flood occurred. And we'll come right back to here, but let's go back to here again. Go to the calendar and either one. So here's the first. Here's the first of the, the second month. And we go down to the 17th of the second month. Hey, that's mid-spring. Isn't that interesting? So the flood occurred not only on a Sunday, according to them, but it's mid-spring. Now, what does that mean? Anything prophetically? I don't know. But the more dates we have, the more likely it is we'll figure out something. All I know is looking at this calendar, when it says Moses or Jesus did something, and it was the whatever day of the month, and then four days later or 15 days later, this happened. You instantly know the day of the week, if it was a Sabbath, what was going on, what festival it was close to. You all of a sudden know a lot if you because this calendar is very simple and very amazing, actually. But I wanted to point that out to you. The 17th of the second month or the 17th of ER is mid-spring on their calendar. So very, very interesting. Not the new year that starts in the spring, but six and a half weeks later. So, okay, let's go back to here and... Okay, where am I at? Let me find my text. Okay, here we go. Uh, so that same day, the fountains of the great were broken up, and all the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, look, we have commentary. So this is getting really cool. So let's go to the commentary for Genesis 10 through 12. And that's for, it's, yeah, point number three. So here it is here. This is from 4Q252, that same one we were looking at earlier. And it says this. The waters of the flood came upon the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month, which is mid-spring, right? The first day of the week, which is, according to that, so we can figure this out, it was Sunday, ER 17, 1656 a.m. And you can figure the the, day, the years from just Genesis by adding everything up. So 1,656 years after creation in the second month, the 17th day in the second month, which happens to be Sunday on their calendar. Uh, and it's mid-spring. It's really interesting that it happens to be that date. Anyway, and there was rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights until the 26th day of the third month, which was the fifth day of the week. And again, in brackets is just me calculating these out. But I mean, if you go to the calendar and find the fifth, uh, the third month, the fifth day of the, of the week, the fifth day of the week would be Friday, Saturday, Thursday. Anyway, oh yeah, here it is. So anyway, we put it in here. It's Thursday, Sivan 26. That didn't happen to be any thing in particular, but that's when the 40 days stopped, according to them. So again, 
the you can see what's happening. They're going to call this not a commentary because it doesn't say this commentary, this commentary. They just kind of throw it in there. So they're going to call this a rewritten Genesis. Well, it looks like a rewritten Genesis, but in reality, it's just Genesis with commentary. Maybe their commentary is wrong, but it's still Genesis with commentary. And because it's written in different forms, they're wanting to kind of super categorize these things. And I think it's messing things up more than it's helping. So let's go back up to this. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. Now, Genesis 8, we didn't have that before either with, until these commentaries were put in here. So Genesis 8, we're missing verses 1 and 2. And it has this, the waters return from off the earth continually. And at the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Now, we should get a date with this, right? So here's number four. So again, from that same scroll, 4Q252, the commentary quotes that. That's where we get that text from. And it's word perfect with Genesis. So it's just, just Genesis. Commentary says, the waters swelled upon the earth for 150 days until the 14th day of the seventh month, the third day of the week. So that would be Tuesday, Tishrei 14. Now, this is really interesting to me because what's Tishrei 15? Does anybody know? Well, you can't tell me, but um, the beginning of tabernacles. So pretty interesting. So it ends the day before. Now, does that mean anything? I don't know. But to see these dates, it might mean something. That's the kind of numbers that we need to get into and look at and see if there's patterns. Not so much the gematria or the super numbers or, or using pi to calculate something. There might be something to that stuff too. But I would rather, if I was going to play with numbers, look at these things out of the scrolls. And I wouldn't put too much stock in numbers anyway, but if it's a clear pattern, it might be interesting. Uh, that doesn't mean it's got anything to do with the rapture or our end of our age or anything like that. Maybe, maybe not. But it's still interesting to have the commentary. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased for two days. So 14, 15, 16, I guess. The fourth and fifth days... On the sixth day, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and it was the 17th day of the seventh month, which is Friday, Tishrei 17. That's two days into uh, tabernacles. So again, it's not on the first day or the last day. It's two days into a um, you know seven-day period. But still, interesting. And it was a Friday, so it was beginning of the Sabbath. Okay, so let's back up to here again. So that was three or four. Okay, so then it goes on and says the ark rested on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month. So that's correct. If their calendar is correct, the 17th day of the seventh month is a Thursday or Friday. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of that month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Again, this is word perfect for Genesis. Uh, more commentary <clears throat> from the same scroll, 4Q252. The water continued to decrease until the tops of the mountains became visible on the first of the 10th month. That's exactly what scripture says. But their commentary says it was the fourth day of the week. So that means it was Wednesday to vet one. Now, if you understand the whole concept, Tevet 1 is the winter day of remembrance. It's actually the first day of the winter season. So again, it's interesting that mid-spring, when the flood occurs, uh, this is midwinter. The others are kind of in the middle, but close by holidays. It came to pass at the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and commentary here, number six, same from the same scroll. Noah opened the window of the ark on the 10th day of the 11th month, which is the first day of the week. So that would be Sunday, Shabbat 10.
So let, let me just out of curiosity or Shavat town. Let me run back here. We go down to Shavat for this year. Shavat 10 was um, a week, uh, not not this last Sunday, which is midwinter, but the week before. So pretty interesting. Oops, where are we at? Here we go. So he opens the door of the ark on that day. So he's going to let the ravens out and the raven out and the dove out. Okay, he sent forth the raven, which went to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Commentary says, the raven went out and returned uh, to make, went out and returned to make known uh, to later generations that, in other words, they're considering this as a symbol or a prophecy of something. What it was, we don't know, because that's missing. Uh, before him, the raven had gone forth and returned. So that doesn't help us any, except that it gave us these scriptures. He also sent forth a dove to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest to the sole of her foot, and she returned to him in the ark for the waters of the face of the whole earth. The lot waters were on the face of the whole earth. And he put forth his hand and he took her and pulled her into the ark. So next one here from the same scroll, he sent forth the dove to see if the waters had abated, but it did not find a resting place and came back to him on the ark. Well, that's what we assumed. Um, and that's probably correct. And he stayed yet another seven days and again sent forth the dove out of the ark and the dove came to him that evening, and see, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters had abated from off the earth. So next commentary part is here. It says that he waited another seven days. He sent out again the dove, and it came to back to him with leaves of a newly plucked olive tr tree in its beak. This was the 24th day of the 11th month which is the first day of the week. So that was Sunday, Shabbat 24. Let me just flip over here. So Sunday, Shabbat 24 is here, which is the first day of the week. So we're here. So that's on our calendar. That's next Sunday. Be the anniversary of that so many thousands of years ago that that happened. Pretty interesting doesn't make much difference at this point but some of these commentaries some of these points are going to start talking about messiah when we get into um uh the prophecy in i think it's chapter 49 about it won't be uh, a lawgiver will not cease from judah until shiloh come and it shall be given to him they interpret that as messiah coming same as we do in the new testament but their commentary is really really interesting and we'll get to it. So it goes on and says that he waited another seven days, sent forth the dove, which never returned to him. And it came to pass in the 601st year of the first month, the first day of the month, actually. So that'd be New Year's. Uh, the waters were dried up from off the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. This was the second month on the 21st day of the month. The earth was dried. So our point number 10 here from the same scroll says it was another seven days later, he sent forth a dove and it didn't return. This was the first day of the 12th month on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, Idar 1. The 31 days after the dove was sent and did not return, the waters were dried up from the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw that the surface of the ground was dried. This was the first day of the first month, which was on the fourth day of the week, Wednesday, Nisan 1, 1657. So New Year's Day of the following year is when that happened. It's not when they left the ark, but that's when it was officially, and he opened the door and opened the window and saw that. So again, that's really interesting showing that. Um, okay. Okay. And then, uh, 
And Noah went forth with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. And that's verse 18, and we're missing verses 19 to 22. But we're glad that we have that portion, not from the Bible passages alone, but from the commentaries. Again, it's going to be really interesting when we look at the rewritten stuff and realize it's not rewritten. It's just Genesis with a different kind of commentary. Put the Genesis in. We're going to really see that it's almost word perfect. There's a few places in here where they seem to add a sentence or two. And my guess, actually, if for most of those, and there's very few of them, those are probably the same thing. In this case, you've got a text, a sentence or two, and a paragraph of commentary. But if you had uh, a couple of paragraphs of Scripture and one little sentence of commentary, you might think, oh, this is rewritten, and what that's in there. So in, in our case, again, no matter how you look at it, it's still Scripture, and then the extra stuff count as commentary. And I think we'll pull these together. So I would love to be able to get a full Old Testament with their full commentary, wouldn't you? But what we have is got some truly amazing things. Um, let's see here. We'll stop there and we'll start with verse or chapter nine next time. And it gives us some interesting things about uh, the prophecy of Shem and those things. But think about this again. Let me just back up to the top. So there's Genesis 1. We've got all, all of Genesis 1 almost. Place or collection, same difference. This is almost a repeat of that. So call it commentary, call it a typo, and they put a sentence in there. Say identical with this here. So then we go on down. You can see all the rest of it is just Genesis. There is no extra stuff. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6. Chapter 7, chapter 8, and that's when we have this commentary. Now, see, if you've got the, the scripture and then a kind of rewritten scripture with commentary, it's obvious that this whole thing here is commentary. So when I read Noah in the 600th year, and I turn around and say it was in Noah's 600th year that, I'm just doing more commentary. So that's pretty interesting, and here's the rest of that. The rest of that. So, so far, other than that one sentence and that one word, no difference. So, that's the first eight chapters of Genesis. And we're going to go through and add, well, we've got, I don't know if I had all that in here or not. I think I stopped with, let me go through here real quick. Genesis 50. Okay, yeah. I don't have, um, this is all we have in Genesis 50, for instance, three, two verses, rather. Um, but again, look, it's identical. How about that? So this is Genesis. We're going to keep adding to it. You're welcome to pull that down, read it on, you know, print it out, whatever. Next week, though, we'll have more. Um, and we'll find, um, I'm working now trying to get the basic um, Exodus done. And again, as we go through, we'll get this whole thing done. And as we go through the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'm fairly confident there's a few things in there that are mislabeled yet something else that are probably going to be Bible plus commentary. And so that's going to be really interesting. So we might be editing this for a long time. But this is my next big project. And I want you guys to, to uh, be there with me as we discover cool things and go forward. So next week, we'll start with Genesis 9 and continue. I don't think it's going to take us too long. Genesis is, like I say, some the first eight chapters were almost whole chapters. Some of these are kind of the same. Others are half, like chapter 50 here is two verses. So, and again, there's no commentary on this, and it's identical. So, here's a bunch of commentary uh, for chapter 49. And see, here's, here's another example. Ours says he kissed them and embraced them. Theirs says he embraced them and kissed them. They just took one phrase and moved it over. But we're wanting to mark all of these. So if that's the kind of differences we have, somebody takes a phrase and flips it around, we don't care. This is cool. This is scripture. 
Okay, so we'll stop there at this point. And what I'll do is go to the chat room and see if we have any questions. We have people visiting for, in the chat room from Texas and Tennessee, uh, New York City, Arizona. John makes a com uh, comment. I got kicked out of another Hebrew Roots group yesterday. That can be considered a blessing, uh, by the way. But anyway, uh, they don't like the truth, not at all. Is it a spirit of pride? After 2,000 years, you would think they would wake up. Well, to be perfectly honest, there is a, um, I mean, that's what the New Testament calls the party of the circumcision, the same thing as the Hebrew roots. Um, the Messianics and the Calvary chapels both, uh, Calvary chapels hang out with Messianics a lot. But we all believe exactly what Paul taught, and most of us don't know what the, the Dead Sea Scrolls teach, but they taught exactly the same thing. Gentiles were never part of following the Mosaic ritual law, and they tend to get all those things messed up, the Sabbath, the sacrifices, Passover, according to Exodus 12, Deuteronomy 14, uh, Gentiles that were Noahides waiting Messiah, saved nonetheless, um, always ate non-kosher food and were actually forbidden to participate in Passover during that dispensation. So they just have to go back and really very carefully read the Torah. It's very specific. But yeah, we've... And, and to say that, it's interesting because there is a church father named Hippolytus that made the comment that when the, not that the Antichrist would do this because they're here now and the Antichrist isn't here yet. But as we get toward the time of the Antichrist, the tribulation period, the end of our age, the beginning of the millennial reign, somewhere along in that line, the party of the circumcision would return. And we see that now. It's the, the hyper Hebrew roots groups. There was a few of them, maybe 50, 100 years ago, but very few. And there are tons of messianics now, which is wonderful. I encourage everybody to study the prophecies and look at the rituals, and you'll see the embedded prophecies, not just in Passover, but in all sorts of things. But yeah, that's when you try to explain that to them, they get kind of upset. Because if Paul's right, then their whole concept is messed up. You know, it's like, you're supposed to do this. Well, actually, I'm Jew. I'm not Jewish, so I'm forbidden to do it. Uh, but you know, we can we can do uh, study the rituals because the law is set aside, so those penalties are too. But yeah, it's pretty interesting. But I'm glad you're trying to witness. Just always remember, in everything, we want to use uh, show the love of Christ. Um, these people are what Paul would call in 1 Corinthians 1 and 3, weak brethren. If they believe in Messiah, and they may not be, it all depends on who, who you were talking with, but if they believe in Messiah, they are believers, they're saved, but they're confused, and they have such a zeal to follow the Lord, although, like Paul said, it's a zeal without knowledge, and so they're weak brethren. And so, those people you want to treat as brethren, but you don't allow them to come into your congregation and disrupt or teach heresy or, you know, cause division. So it's, it's really interesting in that way. But we want to always say, no, brother, you're wrong. That's not what the scripture says. If you want to look at it, we can look at it. And if they leave, they leave. But if they stay and try to cause trouble, that has to be stopped. Anyway. Um, let's see here. Uh, Ken, do you have a book of Nathan? I have part of it, uh, and I'm trying to get uh, other parts of it. Basically, in Kings and Chronicles, for those of you that don't know about it, 
there were five prophets in Samuel's time, Gad, Nathan, Ahijah, Shemaiah, and Iddo, that Kings and Chronicles, specifically Chronicles, say they wrote books of prophecy, uh, chronology, or, or, you know, the Kings, the Chronicles and stuff, uh, and, and a few other things. The five books of those people were taken by some of the lost tribes that were in India. And they still exist. Uh, the book of Gad was able to, one of the guys in the Middle Ages, or a few hundred years ago, became a Christian and decided we need to start getting this stuff out. You can understand if you believe it has more details about the birth of the Messiah and that kind of stuff, and you don't think the Messiah has come yet, you don't want that information out because people will try to kill him. Absolutely correct. People did try to kill him when he came. But once you become a Christian and you realize Jesus has come, there's no way you can kill the baby in Bethlehem anymore. There's no reason to protect those scrolls. And some of those scrolls contain really interesting prophecies for back then and for our time period. We managed to get a hold of Gad and publish that. Uh, so that's another related Dead Sea Scroll, not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the church fathers that talk about the scrolls and the people that ran the school of the prophets, Gad and Nathan, Ahijah, Shemaiah, and Iddo, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and several of the others ran those things, Elijah. So their books are really important. So we're still trying to get uh, the book of Nathan. I've got parts of it. It's some got some really interesting concepts in um, prophecy, and it's one of the favorite ones. When we go to Isaiah, Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall uh, conceive and bear a son. You'll call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The people that object to that would say, Well, the word virgin there is Alma, not Bethula. So it actually just means a young person, not a, you know, not a virgin, which defeats the whole purpose because young people have kids. Old people do not have kids. So if the miraculous sign is that some young lady has a child, that's not even a sign. All young ladies have ch children almost, you know. So, but it's interesting because Nathan will turn around. It doesn't use, the book of Nathan doesn't use Alma or Bethula. It says that in the prophecy that there is this woman that has never known a man but she has in her arms her baby boy, who is the Lord of the earth to the ends of the earth. The Lord of the earth to the ends of the earth, the entire planet, there's only been two of those, Adam and Noah. And so then they lost control. So this guy controls the entire planet. This guy is Messiah, but it's a woman, not Bethula, not Alma, but the words descriptively never known a man. So the book of Nathan is one of those really cool texts that absolutely proves that the ancients believed in a virgin birth, Messiah being God incarnate, uh, that the Father is the Supreme One, the Messiah somehow is God when he comes, and then there's a Holy Spirit. So we see a Trinitarian concept way back when. And it's even mentioned, uh, not by name, not the word Trinity, but the concept is clearly defined in the book of Gad and other places like that. So the Lord is bringing out a lot of interesting things. But since the church fathers mention Gad and Nathan both as being people that ran the school of the prophets, I would not be surprised if in the near future somebody finds one of their books or parts of their books, it's always fragmented, in some new Dead Sea Scroll cave. And that's why it's really important we continue to look for the scrolls. But the Lord has kind of put a, allowed a slow down to be on that for political reasons. If they ever do decide, the Israeli government is basically saying if they ever do decide to do land for politics, land for peace type stuff, it might be that area, which is close to where the Palestinians are. So if that's the case, we don't want to be digging there. And so they've slowed all that down. It's like, no, you want to dig it all out because it's your family's heritage. You can give the land away later. Your family's heritage needs to be yours. And that's very, very important. But then the problem is, and this is what's really cool, the Lord's allowed the Dead Sea Scrolls to exist. The Dead Sea Scrolls, number one, prove Israel is there and it is their land. 
So it's the number one proof text. But it's also a problem because then what happens when somebody just reads the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, they stop being Orthodox Jews and start being more like Essenes. And then they wind up accepting Messiah because it's very clear he came in 32 AD to die for our sins, according to 11Q Melchizedek. So you have all of a sudden this explosion of Messianic Jews all over. And Satan counters that with the party of the circumcision, the hyper-Hebrew roots groups. So, yeah, no, we have a small part of it. We actually do, I believe, have a um, YouTube video on that. And it might be audio. So I need to redo this and actually show you the, the manuscripts and stuff and do a teaching on that. But first, we need to get Genesis done. Very, very important. Anyone ever heard the thought that the rulers that determined the canon weren't led by God entirely? Enoch reveals way too many pertinent truths. I've heard people say that. I don't believe that because the, the consistent teaching through a lot of the scrolls um, and by the church fathers and the Sadducees and the rabbis and the Essenes and the Pharisees, basically everybody, is that the Holy Spirit... Uh, guided by the prophets, and the prophets proved themselves by doing localized prophecies or miracles. So when Isaiah was doing his stuff, you know Isaiah is Isaiah. You don't yell at Elijah. Bears or something will come out of the woodwork and kill you. I mean, he's nobody that you want to mess with. You know, and so these prophets proved themselves, wrote things, and it was added to the canon. And then in the time of Ezra, the canon was closed, according to the, what they say, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and stayed that way into the New Testament. So we have the Old Testament without the Apocrypha. Not that the Apocrypha is worthless, but the Old Testament canon was closed for a reason. And then the New Testament canon came, books were added as prophesied out of the scrolls, and then closed. And so I think the main reason for that is that if we had... A Bible there was actually 400 volumes of like an Encyclopedia Britannica and you had to read that to get saved it would just be way too much I would like all the other stuff but the Bible is the only thing you need for salvation and to understand 90% of everything fairly well um, but the rest of the stuff it doesn't mean that we don't need the scrolls for instance the scrolls tell us what happened during the 400 silent years now we finally know everything, how it all happened, what happened, why, um, if you believe their, their text. Uh, the Book of Enoch was also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They considered it very, very important. Um, but in the Book of Enoch itself, it predicts that there would be a collection of books that the righteous live their life by. That's our Old and New Testaments. And it specifically says that his book, even though it may contain real prophecy, is not to be added to the canon. And so if you believe that it's inspired, then you don't add it to the canon. If you believe it's not inspired, you don't add it to the canon. <laughs> so either way. So the concept is that the canons are what the Holy Spirit wants the public canon to be. So new people, you just give them a Bible. Master this Bible before you master something else. And I think that's why for our generation, there are prophecies in the back of the book of Enoch that are very important, uh, not just the calendar stuff, but other things too. But yeah, I don't think anybody corrupted the Bible or the canon. I think God's in control of that. And the 66 books are supposed to be our rule and guide of faith. Other things very important, but just not to be added to the canon. Now, that being said, I'm glad certain groups added to their canon because otherwise we would have lost those books. So, like the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs was added to the Armenian canon. Should not have been there, but I'm sure glad they did that. So, kept, kept them, in other words.
a little off subject, but do the early church fathers, what do they teach I and mean, what do they teach about the reason for Jesus' 40-day fast? Um, yeah, I do not know for sure. Now, if we can determine when he finished it or when he started it or anything like that, when he was baptized, and plug that into our Dead Sea Scroll calendar, we might be able to figure it out. But I'm not exactly sure. That's a good question. I imagine it definitely has something to do with, because he was here to fulfill all righteousness. So there's probably something that he had to do that for. Uh, Dolores donated $10. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all you guys that support us through PayPal and through YouTube and buying the books and being here and asking questions and letting other people know what we're doing. It's great. We're right past uh, 20,000 follower, uh, yeah, subscribers on YouTube. So we're getting beginning to get close to 21, I believe. Or no, actually, I think we're past 21. Anyway, so we're getting there. It took us forever to get to 20. So now we'll, we'll, won't take us that long to get to 25. Yeah, John was saying some of the, the Hebrew roots people try to discredit Paul. Yeah, throwing him out altogether. I've, I've seen some of their writings talk about Paul was apostate from the law and therefore should be cut out of the Bible. Well, the Holy Spirit put him in the Bible. And the interesting thing about that, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls predicts that when the Age of Grace comes, there would be a new priesthood of the fashion of the Gentiles, That's and they would be called the plucked out or the called out ones. So the Hebrew phraseology for ecclesia, so church. So the actual church was predicted they would have their own canon. And their canon would contain prophecies by the Messiah. That's at least Matthew 24, so I'm going to assume that's the four Gospels. And there would be a Benjamite that would write all of the answers for the age down, and his works would be in this canon. So that's the epistles of Paul, and it actually says... His history would be there, too. So that's the book of Acts. So you've got in the Dead Sea Scrolls a prediction of a New Testament canon with the writings about Messiah, the history of the church, and the, the epistles of Paul. And it's, so that's really interesting. So if the Essenes that were known to be 100% accurate in prophecy predicted Paul and his books being in the canon, and that's God's will, Paul's writings can't be wrong. So if you're thinking of cutting Paul out of the canon, there's a problem because you're, you're misunderstanding it then. You're either misunderstanding Paul or just flat out wrong. Yeah, that's true, too. Anthony was saying that one time they were, we were telling his father to check out some of the crazy HRM groups, Hebrew Roots groups, and someone was trying to say that Paul was Simon Magus. Simon Magus is the father of the Gnostics, and we learn all about them through church history, the early church fathers. Yeah, making Paul a Gnostic, that's, that's really interesting, the fact that he battled them a lot. Yeah, there's some crazy ideas out there.
Um, Dolores says, doesn't it say when when more than one is gathered together in his name, it doesn't mention a day, does it? No, it do, no, it's like Saturday or Sunday. No, it doesn't. And that's the thing. I mean, there are patterns. All those patterns are ritual to teach you something. We can get together at any time and have a Bible study. Um, I go to a Calvary Chapel, which meets on a Sunday morning. Uh, I've got a Bible study on Tuesday night in my house. And you guys meet with me on Mondays and Thursdays evenings. So it's just whenever we can get together. And the important thing is to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So go to some sort of church. You need teaching. That's the main thing. But you also need fellowship. And so that's one thing that's that's really hard to do. This is about the best we can do fellowship-wise as a chat room um, at the moment. But that's a good point. Twenty-one point one k. Okay, subs. Yeah. So I'm a. Well, I was behind slightly. What's your take on Daniel eight twenty-five? Sorry to keep asking, but I bought your book and loaned it out. So if you don't mind, um, no, we can look at it real quick. We got. We have time. Let's see. Uh, Daniel eight twenty-five. As you can tell, I was in Exodus, copying, and pasting. <laughs> okay, Daniel eight. 25. Okay, this is talking about the Antichrist, and through his policy, he also causes craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. I could be wrong in some of this, but this is how I interpret it. Uh, through his policy, his administration, the things that he does, he causes craft to prosper. Uh, eventually, you know, he has the mark of the beast. You have to buy and sell. He controls what the harlot religion controlled before he destroyed it, which is all the commerce. So he's in control of all that, and you can't buy and sell without it. So he really causes, controls it, causes it to prosper, magnifies himself in his heart, and by peace, he destroys many. He comes in trying to be or looking like a man of peace until he gets power. He sides with the, the uh, Babylonian mystery religion until he can get to a position of complete power, and then he destroys it. Uh, so that's the peace part. He also stands up against the prince of princes. That's Messiah. He's anti-Christian. I mean, he may claim to be Christian or whatever, but he's definitely not pro-Christ or he wouldn't be the Antichrist. But he shall be broken without a hand definitely refers to the fact that you and I as human beings couldn't touch him because he's demonically manifest. So he has to be broken, not by human hands, but by the Messiah when he comes back. I think that's what it's referring to. Pastor, oh, past or future. Yeah, I believe that's referring to the Antichrist, so. Okay, and that's all of our questions uh, in the chat room. Okay, so what we'll do, uh, Thursday, of course, we'll have our Q&A, which is kind of like what we were doing here. Next, um, Monday, we will continue with the Genesis study and see what other cool passages are there. We'll, we'll see that 90% or 99% actually of the scriptures are identical to what we have. If there is a difference, it's usually a one word or it's commentary added. And they've just not realized the fact that Somebody could write a commentary with scripture, commentary, scripture, commentary, and other people can actually, not a good idea to do this, but put the commentary in between each verse and just write it like it's a, a letter. And they're considering that rewritten commentaries and Bible, and it really should be all put together as a Bible 
with commentary and we can reformat it that way. So, okay. So we'll be back uh, Thursday with a Q and A and next Monday with our uh, Bible study on the Dead Sea Scroll Genesis. Thank you guys. Have a good week.